Uh, hello, good evening. First of all, I would like to thank Yindrich uh, Halupetsky Society and Meat Factory Residency Program for bringing me here. Except uh, once in 2007, when um, we, what, how, and for whom, we were curating uh, an exhibition at Transit Display. At the time, we actually didn't have uh, very much chance to come here, and I'm very excited to be here for 10 days, meeting artists, curators, uh, people from different institutions. And uh, also, since we didn't present uh, since that exhibition our projects in uh, Czech Republic much, I was asked by uh, my colleagues at uh, Halupetsky Society to do kind of an overview of our curatorial practice. Um, it's not an easy task, given the fact that we have been working together since 1999, so it's, it will be 20 years soon. But I decided to choose a couple of projects, several projects, five, six, I, I don't know, uh, that were all done in Croatia, so they are local projects, and that are all, um, have a kind of an interventionist uh, accent. They're, these are very much interventionist projects that I will be talking about, that were really trying to kind of, um, engage very strongly with the local context. Not all of our projects are so loud, so to say, but I thought maybe for this purpose I would, um, I would talk about these uh, as examples of our work. Um, first of all, the basic introduction to our collective that I said works together since 99. There's four curators, um, me, Anna Devic, Natasha Ilic, Sabina Sabolovic, and the uh, designer and the theorist uh, Dejan Kršić, who was actually importantly instrumental for us coming together, as he was designer and one of the editors of uh, what was at the time called Argzin, anti-war campaign zine, a magazine that was for all of us, and we are uh, growing up in the 90s in Croatia, was very important. Um, space of re intellectual refuge and space where we could uh, look up to as a place where things were written that we could not read elsewhere related to the rise of nationalism and xenophobia. And um, Arxin in, um, published a book on the 150 and published um, new edition of Communist Manifesto on the 150th uh, occasion of, the, um, of the, its original publication. The publication went completely unnoticed. It was with introduction of Slavo Žižek and actually Dejan invited Natasha and then she, Sabina and Anna and then three of them and Argzin and Multimedia Institute that was a really important organization and still is civil organization in Zagreb together with the Croatian Association of Artists that is housed in this building, that round building that you see here, organized this exhibition and um, they always like to joke as everything in socialism was a bit belated. It wasn't an uh, exhibition for 150th anniversary, it was for 152nd. And then the second edition of it happened in Vienna for 153rd exhibition of the Communist Manifesto. What, um, what, how, and for whom are three basic uh, questions of every economic organization. They also concern the planning, realization, concept of the exhibition, as well as the production and distribution of artworks and artist position at labor market. This was uh, how the exhibition uh, was called and we decided to take them as a motto and the title of our collective when we formed a non-profit association in 2001. But uh, to go back to the first project, it was very much connected to the post-war atmosphere of the ni uh, 90s in Croatia. As many of you know, I mean uh, in the 91, uh, the country, in which we grew up, which is Yugoslavia, violently fell apart uh, through series of civil wars. And um, in 91, Croatia became an independent state. These were the, um, when we started this project it, in 2000, we were in our late 20s, and um, we were very much marked by, by this decade of um, extreme right nation, uh, ideologies, nationalism, xenophobia, um, rise of extreme Catholicism, um, militant um, 
complete amnesia and erasure of any kind of socialist past, claims that the history started from ground zero in 1991, and a very strong anti-communist feeling. And what this exhibition actually tried to do is uh, tackle all these and also question the notion of transition. So this is why economic questions and why exhibition actually focused on economy much more than on ideology. And it was uh, actually question what does transition mean? Because at the time a catchphrase for all the Eastern European countries was that we are living in transitional societies and we wanted to ask what this transition is. Where are we transitioning to? Some of the methodologies that we, uh, or, or that, girl, that Anna, Sabina and Natasha started already in 1999 and 2000 when this exhibition opened and that we continued after I joined them in 2001 and to this day, we're actually um, putting together the recent production of young artists with the practices of the artists whose practice belongs to the socially engaged arts since the 60s, so the so-called new artistic practice of the former Yugoslavia, building bridges between the former republics, because at the time there was almost no cultural communication, even with the um, Slovenia, with whom we, for example, didn't have any kind of conflict in the 90s. There was, for a while, no kind of cultural exchanges for the whole previous decade. And also, we, we were trying to establish the international context for the local art production that was missing during the, the decade of the conflict. And, as I said, question this capi new capitalist model, focusing on the relations between art and the economy. Um, the building itself it's very, was a very important site. As I said, it was a uh, um, site of the Association of Croatian Artists at the moment. Colloquially, in uh, Croatian slang, people from Zagreb call it the mosque. It was built uh, before the Second World War and it was given by the gift by the Yugoslav King Petar to the artist of Zagreb, which most of the people in Zagreb actually don't want to remember now. It was built by the famous Croatian um, sculptor and um, sculptor mostly, but he also designed this building for 19th century sculpture and uh, painting, uh, Mes Ivan Meštrović. During the Second World War, it was turned into a mosque. What you see are minarets that were built by a prominent Croatian architect, uh, Planić, Stepan Planić. Because Croatia had a territorial pretensions in Bosnia and was actually at one point the, the Nazi puppet state during the Second World War was even claiming that uh, Bosnia, Bosniaks or Muslims in Bosnia are ethnically Croatian. So weird stories. The minarets were of course torn down immediately after the Second World War and the um, building became the Museum of the Revolution, which it was until the 1991 when the Museum of Revolution was kicked out rather violently. Most of the things were thrown to the streets. And the uh, building became the house of the artists again. So it, it's a very potent uh, site as well. And um, I cannot, I mean, it was an exhibition with over 40 works, artists from 30 plus different countries. I will go into the projects of only two of Croatian artists that were exhibiting very briefly. This is a work by Igor Grubic, artist from Croatia, that actually um, uncovered or made a peephole into the um, very important fresco made while the, while the building was the Museum of a Revolution by one of the most important uh, historically Croatian painters, Edo Murtic. He actually later adopted very, this, this is one of his uh, socialist realist paintings from right after the war, after that he became a prominent of the abstract ex expressionism, one of the most strongest one in former Yugoslavia. This uh, fresco was uh, hidden with a wall when the museum stopped being the museum of revolution and um, he got made a peephole. Uh, this is um, when the building was uh, actually reconstructing, being reconstructed and returned into its original 19th century state a few years after we did the exhibition. The other work uh, was um, work by Sanja Iveković called Nada Dimić File. Nada Dimić was a heroine of the Second World War, a partisan fighter and uh, communist who got killed by the Germans, by the Nazi Germans. 
And uh, as with many people who were heroes of the anti-fascist uh, struggle during the Second World War, there, were factory, there, there was a factory named after her. In 1991, and I will talk about it also when I will be talking about some other projects, um, all the um, names of the anti-fascist heroes from the Second World War became almost forbidden, they became undesirable because the anti-fascism was equated with communism and with what was called Yugo nostalgia at the time of the war conflict and all these names were changed. So the factory became um, Andy, which was actually only the initials of Nada Dimic. Kind of, it was privatized, it was ruined by the guy who privatized it. So in 2000, at the time when we were doing uh, the exhibition, Sanya actually Cont the factory was b getting bankrupt. The, the textile, it was a textile factory. The women who were, it was mostly predominantly female workforce. They were all losing jobs. What Sanya did uh, is set up the um, um, legal service center for women losing jobs, like for giving them advice. But she also relighted the Nada Dimic sign on the factory in the center of the city, which was um, turned off uh, for several years before that, or, or for a decade, in fact. This is the, the publication that uh, came out that gives a bit of a scope. This, all our materials and everything was, of course, since then, designed by Dejan Kršić, whom I mentioned. So we work in a way that Dejan designs all our visual materials and publications, and the uh, four of us curate exhibitions, and he complains about how we curate. The, um, the second uh, project that I would like to talk about is, uh, again, questioning this problematic line of memory around heritage from the times of Yugoslavia and socialism, and a reactionary attitude to our anti-fascist legacy. And this was the exhibition of sculptor Vojn Bakic, who was born in 1915, died in 1992, right after the war. And we did this exhibition in Galeri Nova in 2007. Local and international reception of uh, his work meets periods of intense interpretation and valorization, but also significant silences and breaks of continuities. He was exhibiting, for example, in Venice Biennial in 56, uh, World Expo in Brussels in 58, in Documenta in 59. He was included in all the um, uh, histories of modern sculpture like Michel Safford, Herbert Reed, etc., Kulterman, etc. And 60s and 70s were the peak of his valorization in art history. But the last the decades actually saw material devastation and intellectual marginalization. What you see is the, spomini, uh, is the monument to the victory of people over anti-fascism in Slavonia. It was built in an area that is kind of a rural area next to the small city of Pakrac, so in, 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 the, in like the natural empty area. At the time when it was built, it was the, the biggest abstract sculpture in Europe. What you see maybe down there in the left down corner are two, three little people, so you can get a size of that. Kamenska, it was built with the help of the Aerospace Engineering Institute of uh, Yugoslavia. It was torn down in the um, in early 90s, in 92, by Croatian army. It took them several attempts with dynamite, and nothing exists of it today. Um, so Vojn Bakic, first of all, he was a Serbian in Croatia, which was not good. Not good today, then it was even worse in the 90s. And also the problem with him was that at one point he was seen as the authentic modernist sculptor, sculptor because what maybe it's important to say, when Yugoslavia broke up with Stalin, that was this historical note that we all learned about in school in 1948 when Yugoslavia kind of became independent from the bloc and then started on this path of non-aligned movement, receiving a lot of money from the West and kind of playing this game of sitting on two chairs. 
Also, what was official party politics, the social realism was fairly soon abandoned, and modernism became like the official art. So there is a round bucket, and this was a party line. It was not what many are trying today to present that these modernists were actually the dissidents who were fighting for the freedom of the bourgeois art. It was actually, these were all state-sanctioned, officially-supported artists. So today, the reception of Bakic often oscillates between this free, uh, fighter for the freedom of abstract uh, uh, expression without any ideological content on one hand, and the state artist on the other. But what these actually false dichotomies are failing to see in our view is that the um, notion of artistic freedom of autonomy of art are, is only seemingly disconnected from ideology and politics, which also have, you know, many studies recently shown about the abstract art touring the world with the CIA support, Amer support in relation to American exhibitions. And the fact that neutralization of the art as a means of social critique that was performed by the dis dismissal of avant-garde was actually possible both in the West and in the uh, ex-Yugoslavia. And this complex relationship between the, the marginal modernisms and what is so-called real Western modernism, ideologically free mod neutral modernism of the West are only now um, actually being uh, researched in, in a proper way. And this has been our thesis from the now more than 10 years, that um, through which we also want to kind of get rid of this notion that socialism and communism were some kind of maladies that were produced by some ethnical other, Serbians, Russians, and other people, but that was actually, and, this, and to abandon th those banal cliches, about local history, about strong social realism, and then struggle for modern art by these artistic heroes. Vojn Bakic, since his death, was um, uh, most of his um, estate, most of the sculptures, except um, think some of the monumental pieces that were bought by the big museums in Zagreb, Belgrade, and in few places, but most of the sketches, small, and some very key pieces are actually kept uh, by his family in their apartment at the time in fairly bad state. And um, we came to in contact with them through chance, actually through the work of David Malkovich, who I will talk about a bit later because I would like to go briefly through one of his exhibitions that we organized. Um, who worked around issues of a modernist heritage uh, in former Yugoslavia a lot through his contemporary work. He put us together with the uh, Bakic family and uh, we kind of started talking and uh, decided that we would like to do an exhibition of Bakic because nobody did it for a really long time and nothing was happening. But then what we did, the exhibition was actually not open to the visitors on a daily basis. We put all the sculptures that the family had in their possession at the time at several big tables and on the floor in the gallery and some of the sketches for tapestries and the pieces that were made for the wall, like the famous light forms on the wall. Um, the gallery was closed. We would open it twice to three times a week for a guided tour that was by lo local historians, member of the family, art historians, each time with a different interpretation of the work. And in the space next to the gallery, that is also part of the gallery, but a kind of a little separate room, we installed uh, Dan designed um, in collaboration with a young journalist researcher, like an archive and a timeline of the reception of Bakic throughout the years where people could see TV material about him that we managed to get out from the, the, the national TV, some documentaries, read materials, um, and show different things. What, we, what I would like to also add is that this was not some kind of a curatorial joke to put things under the, you know, behind the glass, on the table, in the closed gallery. It was also result of a very material conditions and we are, we are a tiny gallery with a tiny budget um, 
This is, we also wanted to draw attention to the fact that the institutions should be doing that, this. We didn't have an alarm. We didn't have a night guard. Most of these things don't have a cost. They are the only copy. So one of the reasons was also security. It was actually the material conditions of the gallery that made us also have it closed most of the time. Um, several years later, actually, Bakic had them, um, I think maybe a few now, if this was 12 years ago, I think five years after that, Bakic had a retrospective in Museum of Contemporary Art in Zagreb. It was kind of a big deal. The president came, the, a lot of politicians came, but there was no discussion about the destruction of the monuments at all. It was only his beautiful uh, sculptures presented on the beautiful pedestals. Um, uh, at the same time, the destruction is still going on. What you see here is the monument on Petrova Gora that is um, both the, it's an um, architectural piece. It was a memorial um, center um, in an area that was a really war zone during the Second World War and war zone during the, 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 the civil wars in the Yugoslavia because it was in the area that was very heavily contested. Uh, Petrova Gora, it's the site where the first Croatian king was killed, but also it was the site of a very important partisan hospital, and this is why this monument was built up. It's a bit, bit of a Croatian Guggenheim. It's really beautiful from inside. I'm sorry, I don't have the photos. What you see here is, the, unfortunately, the destruction actually happened after the, the, the conflict ended, because during the 90s, when this was a war zone, nobody could come there. There was a lot of landmines and stuff. When the area was kind of cleared, what happened is that people come and they take the super expensive steel to sell it on the scrap yards. And nobody takes care. It's also in the middle of nowhere, in the kind of a rural area that is very economically backward, that most of the people are left during the conflict years. We tried to do several petitions with the Ministry of Culture. It's super expensive to keep it. What you see on top of it, on the other hand, it's a TECOM relay for the mobile phones. Somebody got permission to do that. So it's a very, very, unfortunate and sad situation. Um, to give a brief glimpse also of the exhibition that um, was um, comment on the institutional situation in Zagreb at the moment is the exhibition that we did uh, with David Malkovic in 2015, so something more recent. It was a retrospective of David Malkovic. David Malkovic was the first who drew our attention to the Petrova Gora, to the Bakic uh, heritage, because in his very famous video trilogy scene for the new heritage, actually he filmed it here in this uh, location. And um, when we uh, did his uh, retrospective, we, he's one of the most established artists of the mid-generation in Croatia and in former Yugoslavia. The, um, his works are being bought by the most um, prominent uh, museums. He, the um, exhibition of um, new acquisitions in MoMA since 1989 to the present day was actually called Scene for the New Heritage, which was the name of the trilogy filmed in the Petrova Gora, and David did not have a retrospective in Zagreb, as many people that I've been mentioning for, for various reasons. We can talk about it sometimes later, what the Museum of Contemporary Art does there. So David wanted actually to do it with us. We decided to do it in fr free small spaces, because this is what we could get. We uh, he decided to deconstruct this notion of the mid-career retrospective, and we did it in Gallery Nova, in his studio, and in the small gallery of the Association of uh, Croatian Designers. And um, rather than present his works chronologically, the exhibition looked into his methods, approaches, obsessions that are shared across the works, and it provides kind of a composite, overlaid uh, overview of his practice. 
And he presented works in a very non-hierarchical way, so works uh, from the very early phases with sketches, with prom props from the, that were used for filming the videos. And in each uh, space, he actually created very strange architectural interventions that kind of um, immediately created this notion of um, strangeness and unusual display in the viewer. So in the Gallery Nova, he built this uh, huge postament, which was actually too high. It was, not a, it was of an unusual height, where you couldn't really approach the works. They were displayed in, a, in this um, strange manner. This is the, the ball from the, one of the videos from the scene from the New Heritage. Behind is his uh, early portrait of his father. Even behind is a print from the, the work that he was exhibiting that year in the Venice Biennial in the central exhibition organized by Okvi Envenzor. So different, um, different works from different phases overlaid over each other. This is the, um, also the, one of his early works, urban intervention turned into a, a, the, the, the photo, photo wall. This is in his studio where he built these huge postaments that were actually overlaid over the, the furniture that he's usually uh, using in the studio. And uh, then again, put together sketches and uh, things from the various periods of his career. And um, in the um, designer Association of Designers, he presented his um, collaborations with various designers and his artistic uh, books. And in this search for this uh, artistic autonomy and for this en engagement with the city and with the social scene, again, I think we, we made a, quite a strong comment by choosing to do this type of the retrospective of one of the most prominent artists for this type of exhibition in three rather modest um, non-institutional spaces in Zagreb um, as a symptom of the, of the institutional framework. And, uh, but also what happened, and we were discussing it later on with friends, visitors, people who came to see the exhibition, David as well, that it also created a very, in my opinion, intimate and um, kind of unexpected um, way of interacting with the works that we would probably not be able to create where we to work, to work in a, in a big, um, big institution. We, mm. okay. Another exhibition that we did the same year, very um, different, and again, uh, much more into direct uh, political commentary was the exhibition that we did in collaboration with the public library. It's um, an initiative of the um, Tomislav Medak and Marcel Mars, two hackers and theoreticians and philosophers from Zagreb, who started the initiative of um, scanning books, what you see behind our scanners, through which you can scan books and put them online. It's of course an illegal activity, but it also draws, uh, it's an advocacy project, it's an art project that uh, is always exhibited in the art institutions in a very strategic way, drawing the attention to the notion of the public library, to the fact that I, for example, didn't know that when the, in America, when the book is borrowed, when a digital book for, from Kindle is borrowed from the library for let's say 15, 20 times, I don't know by heart, they have to destroy the digital copy and buy a new one. Yes. Uh, to the, so it's a um, project that questions the notion of intellectual rights, what the, who owns the knowledge, what is the authority over the knowledge, and um, what means censorship of art, can somebody forbid this type of project when it proclaims itself an artwork, when we were exhibiting this work in an um, exhibition in Reina Sofia, we were, uh, uh, which was called Really Useful Knowledge, we were very happy that a museum such as Reina Sofia actually gave us production funds 
to build a scanner in an anarchist commune in Calafu, which is outside Barcelona. And in the exhibition in the museum itself, or all we exhibited was this card, which was actually leading you to the site and giving you a basic information about the project. But to go back to Zagreb, in Zagreb, uh, 2015 was the year of the 20th anniversary of the uh, Operation Storm, that is an official discourse, Oluya, that is an official discourse uh, considered to be the end. What is an official discourse called Homeland War? What you see here is the parades that were happening uh, in the city for this 20th anniversary of Oluya. And what you see here, it's the image from the Oluya itself. It's the, co it's the column of the refugees that is leaving the country in three, four days between 150 and 250 people left the country. The numbers are disputed depending on who's quoting it, but it's around 5% um, of the population. Croatia is a population of 4 million, so 250 people, it's a lot. It's a lot anywhere. And um, the um, refugee columns are also shelled by Croatian army um, that we are celebrating now. And um, what we did in the gallery for this uh, 20th anniversary of Oluya, it's the exhibition that was uh, in collaboration with the public library called Written Off. So during the in early 90s, um, and there are official numbers um, around, there, there like almost a million books were thrown out of the public libraries um, of all different kinds in Croatia because they were either books on communism, books by Serbian authors, books in Cyrillic, books about workers' rights, books about many things that were deemed unacceptable in the new capitalist independent Croatia. These were often uh, just thrown away like this, sometimes even literally burned. You would not believe that people still have, are in there, would do that in their right minds. Uh, sometimes just put in the boxes in front of the libraries and people would rescue them or take them away home. So what we, and a lot of those books were like that were taken away. So what we did is we invited um, people to bring the books that they rescued, that were in the official discourse um, written off. This is why the exhibition was called Written Off. And to these books were then exhibited in the, in the gallery and scanned uh, during the exhibition. Of course, um, what we wanted to do is um, to actually um, question this um, you know, notion when the media and uh, official politics presented removal and destruction of books as a legitimate and routine procedure of writing of books from the libraries, something that which you have to do. And um, um, are, we argued differently and we wanted to place this destruction of books into the social context where destruction of desirable and unsuitable monuments and books happened uh, simultaneously with the destructions uh, of houses, killing of undesirable people, unsuitable citizens, outside and regardless of war operations. In of, um, and then in this opposition to the official state discourse, which disregards the uh, the critique of military saying that um, there are always casualties in war, wars. We wanted to say no, the war doesn't have to result in the deaths of the hundreds of civilians. And um, we wanted also to draw the attention over the, who has the power to write the history. How is our history actually written? What do we celebrate? And we also wanted to talk about the um, ethno-nationalism as actually other face of the neoliberalism and of this side effect of this capitalism that we have all entered. And refused to uh, accept this rhetoric of the enemy uh, that was necessary for creating the Croatian na nation. For the end, I would like to talk um, briefly about the project, um, our last project that we did in uh, Labin, Rijeka, Pula, uh, and Rasha and Vodnjan last summer. It's a Labin biennial. It's um, 
biennial that was started several years ago by, the, by a small non-profit organization in Labin that is one of the most important mining towns in uh, former Yugoslavia, yeah, was one of the most important mining towns. My, uh, it is also the um, mining region that was heavily developed by Italian fascists in terms of mining, but also Istria is the region which is a peninsula that is now very, very, very touristic, but it was always at a kind of a um, border of uh, different empires. It was um, people who were born there, who, who are like old people living there now, sometimes lived through several states. And uh, the Istria was part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, it was part of Italy, it was part of the first Yugoslavia, the second Yugoslavia, uh, it Ital Italy during the Second World War, but it was also always uh, known as the most tolerant uh, region in uh, Croatia during the 90s as well. It's the region where uh, people were not um, uh, attacked during the 90s. But it was also a region that was, that was very contested after the Second World War, where, ma where many Italians left it. So it's a kind of... Um, very mythical place and we wanted uh, to actually uh, challenge this uh, mythic notion of this mythical notion of Istria with uh, bringing to the fore many different local stories. It happened in Rijeka which is a city on the, on the right, right next to Istria as well because um, Istria was uh, the, the people from Labin wa wanted to collaborate with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Rijeka that is, or that is organizing events as a part of the European cultural capital of 2020. So we wanted also to question this whole notion of the European cultural capital and what is happening through, through that and um, how it works. And what we also uh, wanted uh, so through, uh, the biennial was called on the shoulder of fallen giants and it, um, we the show, this phrase we all of course wanted to question the necessity on leaning on earlier achievements to attain new insights and knowledge to, that intervenes with the feeling of loss of the future horizons that we uh, are feeling today and in this time of need of the social transformation to see what are those fallen giants and on whose shoulders are we actually standing. We also wanted to kind of try to create new narratives and we included, we, we included in the exhibition many locations that were not actually artworks. So the, the map of the exhibition and the narration of the exhibition had uh, various other locations, not only the Museum of Contemporary Art in Rijeka, the mines, the, the Lamparna, which are the mines in, um, in um, Labin, or uh, this, which is an installation of Oscar Murillo in the Augustus Temple, temple from, the, um, from the turn of the, of the millennia, the former millennia, which, was, um, uh, which is called Institute for Reconciliation. So we had many site-specific installations. This inside are uh, uh, Oscar Murillo's effigies of uh, Colombian workers that are, in a way, communicating with the effigies of the Roman ancestors in the Augustus Temple. And when I talk about the, the sites that we included in, in, the, in the exhibition, right next to it, so when you're standing here in front of the temple, the, this image of Divic, which is uh, the, the biggest crane in the, the Pula um, shipyard, was on your left and you could see it. You could see the temple and, and uh, the, the, the crane in the shipyard together. So we kind of wanted to, to draw attention to the shipyard as the exhibition as well. Unfortunately, as the, the biennial was going on, so several weeks after the opening, here in front of the flags, people from the shipyard started protesting because the, the, um, the shipyard is being uh, privatized and dissolved in a really ugly and uh, untransparent uh, way and people are losing jobs. 
Another of the, the, um, the works that was done for the exhibition is the work by Rajka Malkalon. She is an artist uh, from America living in Berlin. She did a series of really uh, nice but also um, heartbreaking um, drawings um, um, that are interventions on a graphical map of the Vladimir Kirin, um, famous uh, Croatian illustrator. This is a map of the, peop of the people in the, uh, in the national costumes of different nationalities at the time living, and minorities at the time living in former Yugoslavia. And she found it somewhere in an uh, antique bookshop in Berlin and um, did these interventions. You can see here, man with a gun. And unfortunately, I don't have more details. But what we also did, we, and uh, she, uh, the work is called Dear Yugoslavia, I regret to inform you. And um, we installed this work in a place in Pula that is called Sense. It is the um, fairly newly opened archive of the materials from the Hague Tribunal in, um, that was dealing with the civil wars in uh, uh, Yugoslavia. So all the materials from the, the court proceedings in the Hague when the court proceedings stops that are related to Croatia and um, uh, where nobody wanted to take them except Pula, this super liberal city. So it's, uh, there is this office and docu documentation center um, that many people uh, of Pula also don't know that exists because it's open only for a few years and we actually wanted to, to install this work there and um, the documentation center was working um, uh, in parallel with the exhibition. This is um, Russia, the, um, the mining town uh, built by the fascists in the early 20s as the prototype of those uh, small socially uh, aware cities where the, the workers, for example, had a, had a hot running water, which was actually with a great standard uh, of living for, for the miners. When um, um, Istria was part of the fascist state and it was actually fueling the, the fascist econ economy as one of the, the strongest um, mining cities um, in uh, Italy even. And uh, this is the, the tour of the city uh, on the day of the opening. And um, uh, for the exhibition, the Croatian artist Marko Tadic did a sound installation in the, um, the, their cinema of the city that was um, um, actually uh, kind of reconstructed maybe 10 years ago, ago and then mysteriously burned down only two months after that. There are various speculations on why that happened and what's going on. So storytelling, history, poetry, tourism, magical thinking, rebellion, colonial uh, implications of um, this uh, uh, mining um, and industry in Istria that is actually not often talked about um, marginalized identities, ethnic cleansing, extractivisms, the um, fossil fuels, um, the remnants of the, the, the previous systems, the collections and memory were some of the, the, the notions that we wanted to, to question through the, this. This is the entrance to the mines in Labin, which, which was like the central place of the, of the biennial. This is, um, we really wanted, because the shoulder, on the shoulder of the fallen giant, uh, when you think of giants, you think of a man, when you think of a miner, you think of a man, of course, this whole mine. And we wanted actually to also bring in the feminist narratives to talk about women, to, to try to open as many n n stories about women as possible. And one of those was the installation of uh, Božena Koncic Badurina, Croatian artist, who worked around the life of uh, Giuseppina Martinuzzi, who was an important poet and a workers' organizer and educator from uh, Istria, uh, founder of the Italian Communist Party, born in Labin. Um, and uh, what Bojena did is uh, kind of made the, the small city museum in Labin to bring uh, out of the depot the, the library of uh, uh, this important revolutionary and uh, she exhibited her books and facts about her life and made also a really beautiful sound uh, installation which you could hear 
which is um, the speech performed by an actress, with co which uh, was uh, put together from different speeches of Giuseppina Martinuzzi, where she talks about how she turned from being a nationalist into being a socialist and a fighter for the, the human rights and rights of the workers, and how she believes in the bright uh, uh, future. Um, again, this is the back in Labin. You can see the entrance to the, the shafts. And the building itself was actually, and this is why it's called the Lamparna, means the space of the light. This, is the, the, this building was where the, the, the miners, before getting down in the shaft, were actually getting their equipment and the, the lights, and would later come back to take, to take off the, the clothes and uh, get showers. This is the work by Zenny Bag that is um, dealing with the first uh, feminist uh, novel and actually putting together footage um, in a way that each time the, the film that you see is different and in, in that way refers to the um, heterogeneous uh, feminist narratives that are coming from various sources and are ne never the same, filmed with a, per uh, a young feminist activist in Paris. This is uh, in the back, uh, the work by uh, Lore Provost, Swallow. And uh, what you see in front are the original uh, uh, amphoras from uh, the Archaeological Museum in Pula, which was one of the organizers of the event. So we, what we also managed to do is borrow some of their ex the, the artifacts that they have and include them in the exhibition, which was very nice. Uh, Nice possibility. This is another uh, artifact from the Museum uh, of uh, Archaeological um, uh, Archaeology in Pula that is a replica of the Dance of the Dead, um, one of the most important uh, frescoes in Istria, uh, which we exhibited together with the Dictionary of Racism by uh, Daniela Ortiz, a Peruvian artist living in uh, uh, Barcelona. These are the drawings by Dan Perzhovsky called Rieka Files in Labin. This is the um, Delete Beach by uh, Phil Collins, uh, dealing with extractivism. Uh, anime set in the, the future, where people are uh, getting uh, drugged by the shots of the oil. The work by Nikolai Olejnikov, uh, also a member of Stodelat Group, um, called My Dear Heart, Where Does This Mine Lead? that is um, a narrative and fictional story about the um, um, Minotaur son of the lost son of Tito. Um, this is uh, one of the locations that we included into the narration of the exhibition, which is the, the sculpture park uh, near the Labin. The also the um, um, bird house of Giuseppina Martinuzzi. This is the performance by uh, Vladka Horvat. Now I'm in Rijeka, the last big venue. Uh, uh, another big shipyard that in the meantime actually almost got closed in Rijeka, Uljanik. What Vladka did is this performance at the entrance of Uljanik is this uh, sculpture to which uh, she uh, st stood there for 12 hours in front of this sculpture holding this um, pieces of uh, wood as a metaphor of the nature. Uh, she invited people to come and um, hold in their hands what they think should be protected and what is valuable for them. Uh, so people came, uh, many people bringing different things and stood with her for as long as they wanted. I selected this image because it shows it's one of the most touching. This is the, 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 the couple that is retired that worked in Uljanik. Uh, this shipyard that, that actually brought the, the little versions of the, the, the sculpture in front of which they're staying, which they got um, when they were getting retired. And they talked about, um, you know, how they left their life in this company that was huge and then employed a large number of people and now today doesn't exist. Again, uh, the um, drawings by uh, Dan Perzhovsky in the, in the Museum of Contemporary Art. The installation by Sinisha Ilich that actually took out the, um, the works from the collection of the Museum of Art and questioned the notion of a peripheral collection, uh, value, uh, memory, uh, urbanism, um, minorities, um, looking. 
the um, wall drawing by Indonesian artist Marianto, who was uh, drawing the um, um, coal mines in Indonesia and uh, their way of devastating the environment. As you can see, they are very different from the ones in Europe. So there are these uh, surface coal mines. Um, this is the um, uh, installation by Focus Grupa, who was um, dealing with uh, the history of the building itself of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Rijeka that used to be a sugar factory. So they were questioned and uh, what they exhibited um, um, small artifacts that we borrowed from the Museum of the Archaeological Art in Pula that were used for distilling sugar in antique times. But uh, on their red wall, they also exhibited the history of the production of sugar in the industrial times and the small photos of the frescoes that they actually found in the building next uh, door that is still not reconstructed, that will one day be Museum of the City of Rijeka. It was also part of the factory. It's a very generic fresco, not something valuable. It, it's a bit like the, you know, the stitch work, one of those frescoes that were kind of bought and then put uh, all over different places. Um, um, according to the schematics, and uh, it depicts um, the smaller images actually depicts uh, slaves and a very colonial enterprise of the, that factory. These are the artifacts that we borrowed from the Archaeological Museum. And for the very end, uh, one more work that we included um, in Rijeka uh, through the city walk. It's, a dem it's the monument to the 13 um, young men that were um, sh executed in retaliation to the um, Italian soldier being uh, killed during the Second World War um, by, the, um, by the partisans. And it's in the area that you would not necessarily walk as a tourist in Rijeka, in a, like a city area. And uh, one of the songs um, of um, Giuseppina Martinuzzi and her relentless optimism that maybe we should, um, despite the fact that um, uh, the times, uh, especially in Croatia, that the right-wing times are not good, should maybe come back to even today. So this would be all from me, unless you have some questions. Sure. Uh, how do you position yourself, I mean your group, uh, in this period of polarization, populism and so on? Because uh, former Yugoslavia is in a very specific place because of the civil war. Uh, so uh, that should make your situation different. I mean, former Yugoslavia is in a very different uh, situation also the, because of the fact, as I mentioned, that uh, each country has uh, had a different socialism. So the socialism was not monolith. Uh, each uh, country had a different experience. So um, we are definitely anti-anti-communist, um, very much. And uh, we consider our, from the very day uh, uh, to be on a very far left uh, spectrum, political spectrum. We position ourselves as uh, uh, feminists. We position ourselves an, as uh, anti-nationalists. So we would not want to declare. We position ourselves as anti-state uh, Croatian. You know, in this respect, as I said, that the um, enemy and uh, was necessary for creation of the Croatian, uh, Croatian state. I think this was very clear from our very first uh, exhibition. And it's fairly um, a polarized position, I would say. And um, we are aware of the fact that we would um, uh, like and have to talk with people from all different sides, and, and we tried to. But we also tried, want to hold our ground to the things that we think are not negotiable. What I meant mm -hmm. is that uh, I would say the present is very different from the 1990s. Sure. And, and so what you have is kind of a almost universal, at least mm -hmm. global uh, phenomenon of populism, right? 
Yes. And, and that's very different from civil war situation. Yes. And polarization and yes. So my question is about this specificity of the current moment. Because what you describe is something which relates to the situation, let's say, earlier. Yes, yes, but yes and no. It's a, something different is going on both on global level but also on local levels. So that's my question because I think that's a very important yes, moment. Yeah, I, and, and we have to take a stand, a position, and that's what I'm interested in. I think... To, yes, it's a different moment, and I think what we also ha need to try to do is see whether we can go beyond polarization, and whether we can talk with people from various ways, and what are the... how we can engage on a popular level, even with populism, but without compromising our, uh, what we stand for how we can create, create, but I'm now talking in abstract terms, it's really hard for me to say without really referring each time to a particular example or the, to a particular situation. And I think for each particular example or for each particular situation you have to devise a new strategy or new tactic. Unfortunately in Croatia this legacy of uh, and, uh, of um, anti-communism, of anti-minorities, uh, uh, which also now goes to sexual minorities, uh, to anybody who is different, keeps being instrumentalized all the time. I mean, the, 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 the photos that I showed you of the, um, of the army marching through the city celebrating this 20th anniversary, it's only a few years ago, you know? And still the biggest insult to somebody, maybe not Yugo nostalgic, nobody cares about that. Yugoslavia fell apart, but the, the, to, to say to somebody that he's a, a Serb lover, it is an insult. Still, so I mean, in, in each particular uh, situation and context, your reaction has to be different. It's, I think so. So, I mean, um, we will now be working much more in Vienna because we, as uh, Teresa mentioned, we, we have to learn about Vienna context and see what will be the programs that we would need to do for Vienna. Uh, what I tried to show actually uh, through, through our presentation is the, these two exhibitions by David Malkovic and by Otpisane that, were, that happened only a few years ago, which were very different. I mean, David's exhibition is a, like, art exhibition, you know? I mean, it's a very formalistic, beautifully set up, uh, dealing with the questions of his formal approach, but it's still commenting on the fact, why are we doing it as a small non-profit organization that has uh, literally four, four to five employees, depending on how the funding goes, and not the Museum of Contemporary Art. But it's still very art historical exhibition in a way. Not art historical because it's not really retrospective, but still, it's an art intervention. And, ot uh, and written off, ot pisane, it was a very politicized exhibition. I mean, there was one art project that is also very activist, public library, and the public call for citizens to bring the books. But we, I mean, use the gallery in very different ways. Like ne next exhibition that we will be doing is the exhibition of Mangelos, who is a really important proto-conceptualist and uh, curator and artist from Croatia, dead for already 30 years. I mean, so we do different things through discussions with our colleagues, with our friends, with the activist community in Zagreb. I mean, the public institution, first of all, is a, a public art institution, is as much as it can, is to give space to artists to do research and experimentation, and so to open the space for artists, that, is go that goes beyond the market. There is so little spaces that are still publicly funded, and that do, do not have to be driven by the fact whether things are going to be sold or not. There is not that many. So what we would like to do is 
you know, work with the artist and give them opportunity to, to work um, on producing new works, on creating new things, on failing. Not every exhibition has to be successful, I think, in a public institution. All of this is harder and harder to defend because the, the numbers and how many people you have drawn in has become the only criteria. I don't think that, that that's necess necessarily the case, but unfortunately this is how most of the politicians talk, this is how the p cultural policy is done. What I heard from people is also, uh, many people in Vienna, but I, I would also like to see on my own, and I don't know enough, is that um, the institution should open up more to the city, that it feels a bit disconnected from the, 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 the Viennese art scene. I don't know. But I mean, I, I was an outsider that would come and see one exhibition per year, so I can't really tell. I will, we, we just, as Teresa said, have been appointed a few weeks ago, and it was a very fast process, so we only know that we are doing it few, for a few weeks now. The moment they selected us, they, they, it was all already out uh, three or four days later, so. We are still meeting with people, learning how the organization works, and. But for me, the, 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 the role of the public institution is really to open up the public space and, and to open up the space for the things that cannot be done um, without the, the, the public support, the public funding support. Maybe you could like, reveal us in a way, um, because like, you apply for a position or like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, a candidate for a position, so you maybe prepare some kind of a program. And then also, like, in a relation somehow to a, like, a, a former, like, Austro Hungarian empire. For me, this, like, or maybe it looks like it's some kind of, kind of like, a political, like, statement also from the position of, like, a Gustavo or, like, Vienna or. And, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I can say what we prepared. I mean, it was a several pages long proposal that was called The Most Beautiful Country in the World that is uh, titled after the film of the Jelimir Zilnik that was actually fil a last film of his that was filmed in Vienna with Syrian refugees and that is a really beautiful uh, documentary. And uh, so we want to deal actually with the fact that Vienna is one of the few cities that still has strong public funding and we want to try to focus on the positive mm -hmm. aspects of it. We said we didn't have to pro give a program proposal, so it was more like a structural proposal. So we didn't give them names of the artist or anything like that. What we did say, but it was also very general, that we want to problematize the notion of Vienna as this city that was always the city that was kind of a first filter of what, show, what is shown from the east on the west. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, and also for us, it was along with the Venice Biennial, which we all took the night train to see one of the first uh, places where we could see art, so we wanna, but we also don't want to just problematize Vienna as, you know, Vienna and the Eastern Europe, but we want to maybe test it as, use it as a kind of a symptom of the whole relationship between the North and the South and the East and the West, and, and what does it mean today? So we will see. What we also would very much like to do is maybe try to experiment with having artists um, longer in Vienna beyond the opening and being involved in all aspects of the organization, including the mediation, education, if we can, but you know, we have to see how that would work. I mean, the, um, we will have to, I mean, ask me in a few months, please. <laughs> we will have to have the program uh, soon, by the end of uh, the, the, there is the, there is the program is programmed until the end of the year. So they have the exhibitions uh, until the end of the next year. Uh, uh, this year, sorry, this year programmed. So our program will, we officially start working in June and we will have the first exhibition sometimes in February, which means we have to invite people fairly soon. I mean, for an exhibition of this kind, I think um, in June when we start, we will have to start inviting first people. But we didn't decide. Uh, Yet. Mm -hmm. Just to ask me a more practical question, but if you guys have collected for quite a long, how do you understand this notion of collectivity? Did it somehow transform over time? Now you're also, as a collective, stepping over a position which was mm -hmm. there for one mm -hmm. person, and uh, so how does this sharing of ideas or, or working uh, together for you, work for you officially, and how did it somehow? 
I think for us the biggest challenge was always uh, how to, as with, so we are a semi-institution. We're a small nonprofit, there's uh, five of us, so f uh, not Dan. Dan is teaching actually at the academy, so he is part of the collective and the designer, but not really part of the semi-institution in organizational terms. He never fundraised and doesn't do that. There's four of us as curators and there's one uh, office manager who is working with us for 10 years now. So for the first 10 years, we, we did not, that was the first kind of a really significant change of dynamics when there was one person that was also employed in the organization but was, was not curating with us. And um, I don't know, so we are like freelancers and not, we are nonstop on this project cycles and looking for money for salaries, for office, for utilities, for electricity, for this and for that and, and also learning and trying to figure out what are the programs that we want to do and uh, imagining new programs. I think the biggest conflicts come out of this overproduction of uh, this self-exhaustion and of then negotiating who will do something that nobody wants to do, you know. I think mm, we have stayed this long together because we don't have any kind of significant disagreements neither regarding our, where politically we stand nor regarding um, what kind of art we want to engage. I don't remember that any, I can like somebody more or somebody less and then we will discuss for this or that re reason who would we want to like to work with or include but I don't remember that any of the, three of them ever proposed uh, an artist that would be like over my dead body now. So, which is good, we somehow found each other in that respect. And in terms of how do we make decisions, we establish different structures, some things are self-understood. Fairly early on we kind of decided, some things were decided without actually verbalizing them, some things we had to verbalize, things were changing for discussions, and we know what are the things that we have to decide by consensus, which sometimes are very painful. So there are some things that there is no kind of uh, voting over each other, but we discuss it forever until we find a, a way. And sometimes even free people give up because on something because one person doesn't want it, no? And then there are things that were at the very beginning we said, okay, is this the thing that we can vote on and kind of resolve in like half an hour or something? So. I don't know. In terms of um, how do we work creatively, all the things, uh, whether we will take on a project, the project's name, the general concept and direction, the artist that will take part in it, this is what we decide all four of us together. We have endless Skypes because Natasha is now in Berlin for quite a while and now Anna will be in Zagreb, we will be between Ber Zagreb and uh, Vienna and Berlin and Vienna and mostly in Vienna. So we have Skype two or three times a week for several hours at least, discussing various things. And then of course then we divide the, the work, you know, the, somebody, you know, if we work with, I don't know, eight artists, each takes two and then coordinate it. But which eight artists, we decide all together. It's not like everybody chooses their own two and then we never came to that. Uh, no, we have to all agree on all the artists we are working with. Yeah. I would like to ask you about this uh, two monuments uh, from Mr. Bakic, about the mm -hmm. in the was in Petro mm -hmm. uh, Are they both restored now or? Uh, no. no. No, so the one in Kamenska next to Pakrats was destroyed, I mean, it was built for 10 years. Mm -hmm. It was super expensive, it will never be restored. And it was raised to the ground and nothing left out, out of it. I mean, no, I don't think this will happen. It's a, it's a, I don't even know, it's, it's, a, it's a major investment for a rich country, no? It's, I don't think that's gonna happen. And Petrova Gora, maybe, I am not sure, no, it actually looks even worse than the photo that I showed you, the ver hardly any metal was left. Um, somebody would need to find a way to use it for something mm -hmm. and it would need to be the, um, I think without the state, the, the Ministry of Culture strong intervention, without a strong political will and um, no. 
No, no. Unfortunately, when Bakic exhibition happened in the Museum of Contemporary Art, and there, there was, a, I mean, several politicians came and, uh, you know, people. Uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art w was not dealing with the destruction of monuments at all. They showed his, um, like, how would you, I say, sculpture from the, ex you know, the, the sculptures, the classical sculptures. They were not... Um, no. The, for example, the destruction of common score, things like that were not mentioned, no. Probably the last question was not so easy, like the communication with uh, let's say mainstream public and politicians in Croatia. Is it better now? How would you describe your communication with them? No, I don't think it's so so actually t uh, uh, terrible. I mean mainstream, depending on what you there's also this um, kind of a liberal mainstream, of course, the super right wing, no, I mean. But the, this liberal mainstream, you know, we're successful abroad. And Croatia, as many of the countries of the, 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 the Balkans and Eastern Europe, has this complex of um, being successful in the West. And this does um, help in communication, I would say, with media. Now, when we were selected for East for Vienna, of course, everybody wanted to interview us. And when we were uh, curators of Istanbul Biennial, it was a big deal. People knew it. Uh, although Istanbul is, is not really West, so they were not so happy about it, but still. I have a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. What was the reception of the exhibition at MoMA last year, Yugoslav Modernist Architecture? because it's kind of a validation from West major Western institution, but also it's a very specific framing of, of the body of work. So um, what, what was the reception in, in Croatia? I think it was uh, given the importance of the exhibition, it was minor. It was really minor reception. Very few articles, very few. Some critical articles by important leftist columnists that were commenting on the fact how minor this reception was. But um, compared to how important this exhibition was, very few newspapers even mentioned it. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for this very thank interesting you. talk. Thank you again for coming. And yeah, we are looking forward to see you on the next Cafe Halutski. Please. <laughs> <laughs>